it's a tremendous honor to be here to, uh, to speak at uh, the occasion of uh, Jean-Pierre's retirement uh, and to offer my congratulations. Uh, uh, when I agreed to speak, I didn't realize I was going to also have to follow Sir Michael Atia, which is, as, uh, as you know, uh, always a daunting task. Um, but, uh, but it's a real pleasure to hear, uh, to hear uh, your thoughts on spinner geometry uh, and, your, uh, and your sense that, uh, that uh, geometry is, uh, is the inspiration that we should be, uh, we should be headed for in, uh, in understanding these modern constructions and, you know, uh, a, uh, a, a window into physics and, and higher mathematics. Uh, and in fact, that's, uh, that's what I'm hoping to give, a, give some flavor of today. But first I want to say, uh, say a little bit about, uh, about uh, my own uh, experience with uh, Jean-Pierre. I think we met in 1979 at the Institute for Advanced Study, uh, this uh, special year in differential geometry. It was a fantastic year for me, and not the least of which reason was that I got to meet Jean-Pierre. And, uh, and, uh, learn about uh, his uh, insights in geometry and uh, uh, spinner geometry, Ramanian geometry, uh, and uh, also the other significance uh, in, you know, beyond just the, just the mathematical experience over the years uh, is that uh, having just finished six years, uh, a mere six years of being uh, uh, director of, of the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute in, in Berkeley, I think I'm in a somewhat rare position to, to appreciate uh, Jean-Pierre's amazing accomplishments over the, over the last uh, 18 years, both, uh, both as a mathematician and administrator and a leader of the, of the international community. And uh, uh, if, I, if I did wear a hat, it would be off to you today, so definitely. Um, now, Jean-Pierre's contributions to mathematics are, have been uh, uh, very diverse and, uh, and far-reaching. Uh, we just heard about uh, spin geometry, which uh, Jean-Pierre wrote, has, uh, has made uh, many contributions to. Uh, and, uh, and of course, I, we, got, we can't uh, survey everything, but I wanted to pick out a single, but I hope you'll agree, very important thread in Jean-Pierre's work. Uh, that of the, uh, the role of calculus of variations in differential geometry. I was very pleased to see that, uh, and somewhat amazed, I have to say, uh, to see that Jean-Pierre recently wrote a book on the calculus of variations in differential geometry uh, while being director, and, uh, uh, which is part of the reason for the amazement, not that, uh, not that he would spend time thinking about calculus of variations, which, uh, which I think we all agree is very important. What I want to talk about is something uh, sort of uh, the converse of this. That is the the role of uh, the role of differential geometry in the calculus of variations, and uh, in 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 a sense to try to uh, understand by geometric means what uh, uh, you know an approach to the calculus of variations, and uh, and for that I wanted to start with a few remarks about Fensler geometry, and if there's time, talk about. Uh, the higher dimensional uh, generalizations that, uh, and, and extensions that, uh, that are now being approached using differential geometry. So the, uh, the Fensler story uh, uh, starts, uh, I can even start further back than, uh, than Sir Michael did, uh, in 1854, there was uh, Riemann wrote this famous, uh, gave this famous lecture on the uh, on how the basic notions of geometry, that is uh, length, distance, metric, and so forth, all uh, all uh, can be thought of as arising from the calculus of variations. That is, uh, that is to specify a uh, to to understand what. Geodesics are straight lines and so forth. One should think uh, one should think in terms of minimizing a functional, and that functional being uh, and I will start here. This is <clears throat> and uh, I'll use slightly more modern language uh, that to start with a function on the tangent bundle. Uh, that gives uh, that gives lengths uh, the idea that uh, that if you have a curve 
you want to associate a length to the curve that depends on this function by integrating from 0 to 1 the function applied to the velocity vector of the curve. Now, of course, in order for this to make sense, uh, that is not to, to be a geometric thing, not, uh, not depend on the parameterization, you have to impose some conditions on f. And the typical conditions are that you want the, uh, you want the, uh, the function to be homogeneous of degree 1. And for my purposes, I'm only going to take, uh, uh, I'm only going to take that in the, uh, in the positive case because I want to allow for the possibility that, the, uh, that uh, the length of a curve in one direction may not be the same as the length in the other, uh, as you tra traverse it in the other direction. And for reasons that have to do with the regularity of the calculus of variations applied to this problem, uh, you, want to require that, uh, you want to require that f squared uh, should be, uh, should be uh, strictly convex on each tangent space. On, uh, on TXM for all X. And the picture you should have in mind is that if you look at the level set, the so-called indicatrix, uh, if you sigma X is the set of V and TXM such that F of V is 1, this is usually called the, uh, the tangent indicatrix, that it should be a convex curve uh, enclosing the origin. Typical u here in, uh, in sigma x, this is the, the tangent space. <coughs> and uh, uh, under these assumptions, the, uh, the idea of finding a minimizing curve joining two points is, uh, uh, behaves well, and you get a nice, uh, a nice family of things that are infinitesimally, anyway, the straight lines, the notion of shortest curves joining any two points, which become the geodesics. Now, uh, the, uh, the natural question is, how do you distinguish, would it, uh, so you have a notion of straight line joining any two sufficiently nearby points, how do you distinguish two such geometries from each other? And, uh, of course, you can't distinguish it looking only at one, one line because all lines will in, internally look the same. But, uh, but if you consider how rays are separated, uh, you begin to get uh, a way of distinguishing the geometries. So if you look at ray separation by, <clears throat> that is, starting at two, two rays starting at... Uh, yeah, I'm starting at, a, at, a, at an initial point, and you look at, uh, and you look if you go a distance s along one of the one of the geodesics, and you ask how fast, how rapidly do they separate? This notion of distance, by the way, is the usual, uh, the the infimum of the length of curves joining two points. Then, uh, then the uh, the interesting quantity, just to remind uh, everyone, uh, <clears throat> this picture, of course, there's a, the first order, the first order, to first order, this depends on what you might think of as the angle, but you don't necessarily know what angles are in, uh, in Ramanian geometry. And so uh, what I'll do is actually just put out, put some constant growing linearly uh, that depends on the two rays. And then, the, and then to the next order, what happens is you get something like this. And I put the 6 in because that's the classic normalization, up to the order of something to the fourth power in S or the square uh, of the second power in, uh, in, this, uh, in this separation, this uh, lowest order separation constant. The, uh, of course, as, as gamma approaches rho, C gamma rho goes to zero, as you would expect. Uh, but this is, the, uh, this is the expansion you would expect. This quantity, uh, which, uh, which sort of measures the deviation from the way straight lines would separate, is, uh, is, the, uh, is the flag curvature. It's called the flag curvature because it's, 
uh, it depends not just on the uh, not just on the two plane in which the you know infinitesimally the two geodesics lie, but it depends on which order you do this. I mean, and the and it depends on which on the actual specific rho and gamma. That is, uh, it, k gamma rho is not necessarily k rho gamma even. <coughs> And, uh, and it depends on, you know, the idea is you fix a row and then you see how, see how gamma varies. And this is, in some sense, the, what you might think of as the first geometric uh, piece of information that comes out of, uh, of a given uh, Ramanian structure. Uh, this, is, uh, this is what's known as the flag curvature. Sorry? Something? Oh, the, oh, yeah, it's probably, am I making too much noise? Maybe they can adjust the volume or something. I'll, I'll try to keep a. <clears throat> and, uh, and it uh, is, in some sense, the fundamental invariant in, uh, in, uh, in this, uh, this notion of geometry, this metric notion of geometry that Riemann, uh, Riemann established. Uh, one thing you can see, for example, uh, an example I always like to give in the uh, in pictures like this is a physical example. The the river uh, uh, example. You imagine you have a uh, imagine you have for simplicity. Let's make it a just make it a, a a straight river, and you have current flowing faster in the middle and slower at the uh, slower at the uh, at the ends <coughs> uh, at the banks, uh, and uh, and the set of displacements that you can reach in unit time is not, of course, centered on the uh, centered on the point where you are, but it's shifted over by uh, by the current. Right? It's <coughs> and my drawing is not so great, but but uh, you can see you have a you have something strictly convex towards the uh, towards the uh, towards the origin at each point, but it's not centered on the origin. If you look at the geodesics, uh, leaving a point, say, in the center, as they go downstream, what happens is that the, is that the geodesics separate faster than, uh, faster than you would expect. That's uh, k negative. <coughs> but if you go upstream, the geodesics tend to do something like this. And uh, the geodesics, uh, the geodesics tend to come together. Uh, so even in a, even in the two-dimensional case, the you can see the flag curvature depends on the uh, depends on the on the geodesics, not just on the two-plane that it's, uh, uh, and the direction you're going in. Uh, <coughs> now, in uh, uh, of course, Riemann looked at this uh, situation and he figured out what the uh, uh, what the case if the if f is actually if f squared is actually quadratic, which is the case we now call Riemannian geometry, is quadratic form Riemannian geometry. Then uh, then k constant. Uh, exists uh, is classified. We all know what those answers are, the, the so-called space forms. And Riemann, in fact, himself gave, the, uh, gave a formula for what the metric looks like after change of coordinates if the, if, uh, if the, if the flag curvature is identically constant, but uh, in the Riemannian case. But in the non-Romanian case, that's still, uh, that's still very much an open problem, exactly what the, what the k equals constant, uh, constant things look like. Uh, in fact, uh, it's not obvious from the definition that I gave that k is actually a differential invariant, that it can be computed by some kind of, by some kind of doing differentiation. Uh, I'll say a little bit about how that's done in a minute, uh, but it is true. and. Uh, uh, and so the uh, natural question is, what, what kind of equation is k constant in the general case? Uh, 
Hilbert gave examples that turned out uh, uh, so-called the Hilbert projective metrics. Uh, gave examples on convex domains that uh, using cross-ratio formulas that I won't write down, the, gave examples of these, uh, these kinds of uh, 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 metric structures with the property that they have k is identically minus 1 uh, that are not Riemannian. That is, they're, uh, they're, uh, the, the unit sphere at each point is not, is not a uh, is not a quadratic is not an ellipse centered at the origin. Uh, uh, in 1919, uh, Fensler, Paul Fensler, uh, made a uh, started a kind of geometric study of this uh, of of these kinds of structures, and that's why we call them Fensler geometry today. And there's been uh, uh, a string of uh, a string of uh, of people involved. Uh, uh, in 1934, Carton wrote a uh, 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 wrote a, uh, a book on Fensler geometry. In uh, 1943, Chern. Uh, uh, applied the method of equivalence to uh, Fensler geometry, uh, and uh, and in some sense, okay, uh, applied uh, a method of equivalence, uh, and uh, and in some sense derived the derived the fundamental invariance. And I'm not going to go through that derivation. We don't have anything like the time, but uh, but I, I I will say uh, uh, I will have to call on these uh, call on these uh, things for some uh, for some of the ideas, I mean, for some of the results. Uh, and uh, and it's now known uh, uh, just to give another example beyond. Beyond this, it's now known, for example, that uh, that even on the two sphere, even on uh, the space of uh, of Fensler metrics with uh, k identically one, uh, is infinite dimensional mod diffeomorphisms. Uh, <clears throat> even even if you on the two sphere, even if you fix, even if you require that the geodesics be the great circles, uh, that is, if you, that is, even if you assume that the curvature is one and it's projectively flat, there's still a ten-parameter family of of uh, of of distinct Fensler metrics with that property. So even plus projectively flat. 10 parameter family. Is that chance to oh, no, no, this is something uh, I should say I did this. Uh, family of, uh, of examples. Do you want to relate the 10 parameters are actually five, it turns out. There's, it's actually a complex manifold. The space, of, the space of solutions turns out to be a complex manifold. Uh, and uh, and it's uh, and it's the one of the things I'm going to tell you about is is how complex geometry comes into this picture, because it's not at all obvious that there's any complex geometry involved. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so, yeah. <coughs> now, uh, now, yeah. So. So. L locally, locally, there's an infinite dimensional family of solutions as far as uh, even uh, projectively flat ones. That's right. Yeah, right. Still infinite dimensional, projectively flat. K equals one. Right. Yeah. 
locally. It's, a, it's definitely a global theorem. You, I mean, the deformations use the fact that you, you find a rational curve somewhere and you look at its nor the deformations of a uh, rational curve in a holomorphic manifold somewhere and you find it's a deformation space, compute its normal bundle. Uh, <coughs> yes. Um, on the other hand, uh, in uh, 1988, uh, Akbar Zadeh Uh, showed that if uh, M2 is compact and K is identically minus 1, then, uh, then, uh, uh, then F, is fin F is Ramanian. <clears throat> uh, I mean, if you think about it, what, you know, what's happening here is a, is a little bit you know, just to give you a sense of what's, uh, what's odd, is that even for, the, even for the surface case, if you look at K, K is, is being defined basically in terms of this uh, hypersurface in the, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the tangent bundle. So, it's, so actually the variable is a three manifold, not a two manifold. And, uh, and K as a function on that, on that object, it depends on four derivatives of that hypersurface sitting in, sitting in, the, sitting in the tangent bundle. And it's not an elliptic equation. It's neither elliptic nor hyperbolic. It's uh, quite complicated. And you use the non, you use the, use the, the degeneracy of it to prove, uh, you know, it's a sort, sort of certain conservation laws that show up to prove this statement in the k equals minus one case, but nothing like that works in the k equals plus one case. Give you some sense of how, how you know, odd it is from the point of view of PDE. You might think, well, how could it be fourth order? Because in the Ramanian case, it's second order. And the reason is, it turns out, that, that if you impose the Ramanian condition, the, higher the coefficients of the higher derivatives drop out. And so you actually only, it, it reduces to a second order equation, whereas it's naturally a fourth order equation, surprisingly. But is the fact that the fourth order is connected to the fact that the Finster geometry gives rise to a Riemannian junction to the tangent bundle? Uh, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, uh, but it is important. That you're, you just raised a really important point that there is a Riemannian structure on, uh, on uh, sigma, in fact, uh, on, the, uh, on the unit tangent bundle. And that's what I... Uh, that's what I wanted to uh, to point out. <clears throat> yes, so the uh, <clears throat> to uh, in more detail. Uh, we started out with sigma sitting inside the tangent bundle of M, and I'm going to let M be n plus one dimensional. For uh, I'm going to now go back to the general, and I'm going to assume M is oriented uh, to. Uh, to, for uh, simplicity. There's a natural inclusion of sigma, though, the, the Legendre transformation that maps sigma into the cotangent bundle. The point being that if you have a point, uh, here's, the, here's the unit sphere bundle, here's, U, here's a point U in, in sigma, there is, a, there is a, a one form, tau U, in the cotangent bundle that satisfies that tau of u applied to u is 1 and tau is less than or equal to 1 on sigma x. That is, it's the, it's the one form that, uh, that whose level set equals 1 is exactly the tangent plane to the, to the indicatrix at that point. That naturally maps tau into the cotangent bundle and it's an embedding. Uh, and so the, the, net, the canonical one form on the cotangent bundle pulls back to sigma. So, so sigma has a, has a uh, canonical one form on it. Sigma has a, has a contact structure. Alpha. <clears throat> and of course the classic uh, picture is that uh, is that, uh, that contact structure gives rise to the, uh, to the geodesic flow. The Rabe vector field of alpha is the geodesic flow. Say E is geodesic flow. Uh, 
Uh, now, as, as Jean-Pierre mentioned, there's a, uh, it follows in particular from the work of Chern, although it's kind of implicit in Carton's analysis, that, that although there's no natural Riemannian metric induced on M, there is a natural Riemannian metric induced on sigma. Uh, there it is. ds squared on sigma. And, uh, and E has unit length with respect to that. Uh, sigma is the union of all the indicatrices. That is, each sigma x is a hypersurface in each tangent plane. You take the union of those, it's a hypersurface in the cotangent, in a tangent bundle. That's right, exactly. It's the level set of f equals 1. Uh, and it turns out there is a natural Riemannian metric on this. Uh, uh, the, uh, the dynamical properties of this geodesic flow are very interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming the are smooth, that's right. Yeah, if you don't assume smoothness, then, then all kinds of bad things can happen, right? Uh, uh, and I should, you know, for, the, for, the, uh, uh, for a, a very nice interpretation of not only this metric, but the flow and geometrically in terms of dynamical systems, you should look at uh, uh, Patrick Foulon work on, on the dynamics. Uh, of E uh, and interpretation of this of this geometry. Geometry. But what I want to focus on is, uh, is here's a consequence of k is identically 1. And I'm going to focus on the k is 1 case. The k is minus 1 case has a similar development. But, uh, but I'm going to focus on the k equals 1 case today. <coughs> uh, is the following proposition that if k is identically 1, then, uh, then, uh, then uh, the metric is invariant under the under the uh, under the uh, 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 geodesic flow. This canonical metric is invariant under geodesic flow. <coughs> uh, in fact, that's almost a that's almost equivalent to k equals one. Uh, and so you get the following picture, which is uh, which will turn out to be important. If you look at sigma, of course, mapping down to m uh, by it's normal projection. Uh, the uh, if this if this uh, if the flow is ge is geodesically simple, that is, if there's a quotient uh, by the flow of E, call that Q, the space of geodesics. <coughs> uh, call that lambda mapping down to the space of geodesics. This is n plus 1 dimensional, 2n plus 1 dimensional, 2n dimensional. Uh, that says that in the k equals 1 case, what happens is that there's a well-defined uh, quotient metric, ds bar squared. It's, well, you can ask it locally and globally. If, the, uh, if, you, want, if you just want to look at the local solutions, you can just take a, take a local convex patch. And they're always in the in the geodesic flow will be geodesically simple on the convex patch, but this can actually happen for the n sphere or the n plus one sphere. In fact, there are this uh, two dimensional case. This fact generalizes to the generalizes to the uh, to all dimensions that the that the space of projectively flat k is identically one metrics on the on the n sphere or the n plus one sphere turns out to be a complex manifold in a natural way. Uh, in fact, it's identifiable with the space of quadrics in Cp n plus 1 without real points, interestingly enough. Uh, <coughs> but so there's, there's both local and global questions. Right now, I mean, we can focus on the local. Uh, what it says is that there's a natural metric on the space of geodesics. Now, just from, uh, just from uh, classic, uh, classic calculus of variations, we know that because this guy has uh, because this guy is the quotient by the ray vector field of, uh, you know, in this contact structure, there's actually also a symplectic structure uh, where, 
omega has the property that when you pull back omega to, uh, to this guy, you get the differential of, uh, of the contact form alpha. So this guy comes equipped with both a metric and a uh, and a uh, and a symplectic structure, and a priori, uh, you know, it's not obvious that they have much to do with one another. But it turns out, uh, and here's the the beautiful fact that in the case identically one case, when k is identically one, q ds squared omega is a Kähler manifold. Uh, in, in fact, uh, in fact, my geodesics are always oriented because I took. Uh, yes, but in the space, yes, but I only divide it out by the geodesic flow, right? Yeah, but, but, but you have also the space of geodesics. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, my definition of geodesic is oriented geodesic. My curves are all oriented. No, I mean, put in oriented if you, everywhere if you want, okay? Right. <clears throat> so it turns out that this is, in fact, a Kähler manifold. Uh, very, uh, uh, very, well, it was a big surprise to me. And in particular, it shows that the, that the natural, so of course there's a natural levi chavita connection on it, uh, and what it says is that uh, the holonomy of, the holonomy of uh, NABLA is uh, UN. In general, <clears throat> that's the largest it could be if the if the metric is a, is Kähler. This is the special case in the special case where uh, where uh, where you actually where you start out with the n plus one sphere with the standard metric. The holonomy actually drops. Uh, special case. M n plus one f is s n plus one canonical. Then uh, then q actually turns out to be isometric to s o n plus two mod s o two cross s o n. So the holonomy is actually s o two cross s o n, so which is a proper subgroup, of course, of u n. But uh, uh, and while in the general case, it does not reduce. Something of this survives in the sense that there is, it turns out, a natural circle action that, uh, and uh, while there's not quite a natural SON structure, there is, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a sort of a remnant of it. And I need to describe that. <clears throat> the point is this, that over in M, oh yes, good. I need a few couple of colors. <clears throat> A point of Q is, of course, a curve in M, an oriented curve in M. And if you, and a point in M, though, a point in M, when you look at what it corresponds to over in Q, is you lift it up and push it down, it's a Lagrangian submanifold. It's an n dimensional Lagrangian submanifold. Let's call this, let's call this CX which is lambda pi inverse of x, for x in here. <clears throat> so there's a, in fact, there's a one parameter family of, uh, a one parameter family of Lagrangian submanifolds sitting in here. <clears throat> and the, the next thing that turns out to be true, it's a very, a very beautiful geometry is that if you look at the uh, if you look at the tangent spaces uh, of these of these guys, if you look at the tangent space at uh, this guy, which I failed to name as Q, <clears throat> if you look at the tangent space at Q to uh, to these. Uh, these Lagrangian submanifolds, they all turn out to be e to the i theta times uh, the tangent space of one of them. Thank you. To see. Yeah. 
In other words, what happens as you as as you move along the as you move along the fiber is you have this one parameter family of special of Lagrangian submanifolds that are all uh, that are all they're all intersecting in Q and they intersect uniquely at Q and they just uh, and they just rotate like that. So actually, it turns out that the that there's a natural there's a reduction of the structure group here from U n to a subgroup which is which is basically S one times S O n. So uh, here's U n uh, and sitting in there there's S one times O n. There's a natural reduction of structure from, uh, from, from this guy down to this guy. And um, unfortunately, it happens that, when, that this, this reduced structure is not torsion free. Remember, Kähler is the same as a UN structure that's torsion free. The NABLA reduces reduced to this is not torsion free. Well, but at, uh, of course, UN is sitting here in uh, GLNC. Uh, this S1 times ON has another enlargement, S1 times GLNR. <clears throat> it's not torsion free except in the flat case, sorry, except in. Uh, this uh, this very flat case in this symmetric space case, Ramanian. <clears throat> so there is a reduction to this, which is not torsion free. But then, because of course this grouping contains this one, which is sitting inside uh, GL in C. Uh, the miracle is that, that this, this enlarged structure, NABLA actually turns out to be torsion free. NABLA is torsion free here, is compatible with this. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't say that. So, uh, no, that's right. NABLA is compatible with this structure. Actually, no. Uh, I have to be careful. When you reduce, you can split this into a uh, into uh, the the connection splits into. Sorry, I should say it. Please. The connection splits into uh, a reduced connection and a uh, and a torsion tensor, which only vanishes in that case. Well, nabla not is compatible with this structure. And in fact, its holonomy is generally equal to this. Equal to S1 times GLNR in general. When I first noticed this, uh, and it's kind of the result of a calculation, uh, I was astonished because there had been a classification of the possible torsion-free holonomies in, in, uh, in uh, affine geometry that was completed by, uh, that was started by Berger uh, with up to a finite number of exceptions uh, and, uh, and then uh, carried, carried further uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, and the published list still did not have this one on there. And, but uh, turns out that this actually gives, uh, gives examples. Uh, and if you go back and look at the analysis that was done, you can see where the gap occurred. Uh, this so these actually turn up to exist. And uh, the beautiful thing is that there's a nice converse, which is that if you start with a 2 n dimensional manifold, uh, it's a complex manifold uh, that has a, uh, has a connection on it whose torsion is, is this you know, complex multiples of the identity times this GLNR. If you start with such a guy, there is a natural, uh, the curvature form associated to the S1, that's a form of type 1, 1 you can prove. And if it's positive, then you can retrace the steps 
and locally anyway recover a Fensler metric with k is 1. So the, so, so the Fensler metrics with k is 1 actually turn out to be intimately tied to the holonomy problem in, uh, in affine geometry. And uh, I wanted to give this example because it shows that there's, a, there's actually a lot of geometry in, the cal in calculus of variations problems. That, uh, that you know, if you pursue the, the, the general structure and look at what it tells you, there's, there's, uh, it turns out a, a lot of the tools of differential geometry come, come into play to help us understand things like not just this, but calibrations, uh, uh, when things are actually minimizing as opposed to merely locally minimizing, and so on. Uh, and I think that we are really, uh, while we've made some progress on this, there's still a lot to do. There's still a lot, uh, a lot more to go and a lot more to discover in the, the, the differential geometric aspects of the calculus of variations. Now, I'm almost out of time, and uh, I was supposed to have allowed more time for questions. Uh, I just want to say that the that the second part of the talk uh, was to have been about what happens if you look in higher dimensions. That is, instead of, instead of specifying in each direction uh, a size, suppose you do as Carton did in, uh, in uh, uh, 1933. He wrote a little book called uh, On Metric Spaces Based on the Notion of Area, where what you do is start with, uh, in, the, in his particular case, on a three-manifold, he started with a geometry that specifies the volume of every two-plane and wanted to know what, uh, what kind of geometry can you get out of that. And it turns out there's a very beautiful geometric story that you can, uh, that you can tell. Uh, something that Philip Griffiths and I have been thinking about for, uh, for uh, the last few years is uh, generalizations of this to higher dimensions where it turns out that unlike in Carton's case, where there was a unique canonical form that you could attach, the poincare carton form, there's now, uh, in, uh, when you go to higher co-dimension, that is, you look at surfaces in four space, or surfaces in six space, or things like that, uh, or five, you know, four folds in six space, it turns out that the notion of canonical form is much more subtle, and, uh, and depends on higher derivatives. Uh, but there's still a geometry there that I think is not well understood, and, uh, and there's uh, a lot uh, a lot more for us to learn about its relationship, uh, a lot more for us to learn by analyzing it using the tools of differential geometry. Uh, so that's where I, I want to stop. So thank you for. Questions? <laughs> there is a question for. So you, the, the statement here is, of course, a local statement. The k equals one. Uh, that k equals one says that this is true. That's right. For k equal minus one. Well, in there's actually yeah there's actually uh, you have to replace this natural Riemannian metric with a pseudo Riemannian metric, and in the pseudo Riemannian case, what happens is that the what happens is that the the thing that pushes down is a is a is a somewhat different structure, but you can still pursue it. Uh, there's still a differential geometry, and it leads to a kind of a a, a different holonomy that's not. Uh, so then the statement that the lead derivative of the, of the... Of that modified thing is still zero. That's correct. Right. That's correct. To follow on Sonaiko, is there a natural square root of Kinsler geometry? Uh, gee, I don't know. I mean, in some sense, the fact that a complex structure shows up here, uh, Whereas there's no, there's not even a natural Riemannian structure here, but uh, an actual Kähler structure shows up here, says something about, uh, says something about, you know, if Kähler geometry is uh, some kind of square root of, of Riemannian geometry or geometry in general, this is a vindication of that point of view. Yeah. Is there any the complex structures appearing here? Is there any relationship with the twister theory? Um, not in the, not in the sense that I that I understand twister theory normally. It's actually, although there is actually a connection, uh, it turns out with uh, uh, something I haven't said is, uh, for example, in the n equals one case, it turns out that these things, when you look at the transform over here, they, they turn out to actually be Zoll metrics. And, uh, and the Zoll metrics 
uh, that, uh, you know, uh, uh, LeBrun and Mason have shown that you can, that you can understand Zoll metrics uh, on the two sphere in terms of uh, a kind of a twister construction looking at, the, at, looking at holomorphic uh, disks whose boundary lie on a certain real submanifold of complex projective two space. You look at the moduli of holomorphic disks that uh, that lie in that boundary, and uh, and so they've uh, they have uh, 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 a very nice uh, improvement of our understanding of Zoll metrics uh, and constructions of Zoll metrics through that kind of they call it twister they call it a twister construction of Zoll metrics, uh, but it's not twi it's not you know it's it's twister more in the sense of using complex geometry to solve a solve a, a global Ramanian geometry thing than it is in terms of the the classic twister construction of, of uh, Penrose. Right. Yeah. 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 Thanks.